we are going to talk about a less known individual. You might remember him more because his name's so fun to say, Jehoshaphat. <laughs> but he is among the kings that ruled Israel after the great division. There were only three kings that ruled a united Israel with all 12 tribes. The first one was Saul that Samuel anointed. And the second was David. And the third is Solomon. And then there was a giant revolt. Because though we love Solomon's wisdom and uh, we admire him for his building prowess, he never stopped building. He kept building and building one fortress after another after the temple uh, had been finished. And with all of his building projects, just like all government building projects, it is paid for by what? Taxes. Taxes. And so Jerusalem was down in the south end of Israel. And uh, the ten tribes of the north, well, were north. And so for years, um, Solomon, in order to build the temple and gather everything necessary for that and to build these other uh, structures at Megiddo, we'll talk about that, especially with those going to Israel. But they, when he passed away and um, Rehoboam uh, was king in the, in, the, in the south, the north decided, we're done paying taxes. We're done with constricted labor, and we're done being bossed around by you. And so the king of the north became Jeroboam. And though they did try uh, on many occasions to reconcile, the people of the north just simply said, no way. And that left Benjamin and Judah. And so the... Um, Books of First and Second Chronicles basically cover that period from the, the revolt to the decree of Cyrus after the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. It covers that time between the divided nation. In other words, when they went into captivity, they were divided at that point. And then Cyrus, some 400 years later, gave the decree released Ezra to begin the process of rebuilding Israel and reclaiming uh, Judah. Now, during that particular time, it's a very interesting study if you want to. The ten tribes lost and gained and lost and gained, but mostly lost territory. And, of course, Judah had remained pretty much the same, but they all went off, didn't matter, all went off for 70 years in Babylon, also fulfilling prophecy. Now, you'll find amongst all the kings that most of them were bad guys. Jehoshaphat was a good guy. Though he had a brief time where he was allied with Jezebel and Ahab, and if you recall, they were the bad people that faced off against Elijah. And um, it, uh, it's during that particular time that, of Jehoshaphat that this event uh, took place. Chapter 20 of Second Chronicles, if you're following along with an analog version of the Bible. <laughs> Chapter 20, verse 1. It happened after this that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon and others with them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. This was a threat to Jehoshaphat and his kingdom, and it happened... Um, just after he returned from a rebuke from God and really began to seek God. If you have an experience with the Lord and something great happens, always expect counterattack. And you'd have to back up into the other chapter, 19, to pick up with this. But Jehoshaphat was just getting his priorities straight, just getting things in order, and this threat comes along. And uh, it follows his near-death experience when he did a lie with King Ahab. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon, Tamar, which is in Gedi. Uh, David's famous in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared 
and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. Now there was a sense, of course, that Jehoshaphat feared this great army, multiple peoples coming against him, but he does the absolute right thing, as is clear here. He, he calls the whole nation to, to pray and to fast. And it seems to me that, that Jehoshaphat is, he fears uh, what he knows of God more than this enemy which was the first, his first thought. His first, instead of his first thought being fear, his first thought was to fear the awesomeness of God. Amen. And, and he, it seems as though, and it, it takes forever for people to do this. You get an enter into a trial, and sometimes it can take days, months, years to figure out the scale that God is greater than any problem you have. And you just have to decide, how long do I remain in misery? before I believe that God's in control, because whether you're miserable or not, he's still in control, especially with things that you can't change. So one of the great things about this, this near miss on Je Jehoshaphat's part is it taught him who was God and who wasn't. So his first response was to fear God than to fear the enemy. That's a, that's a nice way to live. You don't spend as much time under as much stress. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Now, if that isn't church, it'll do till church comes along. When everybody from all around comes from the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. I could spend all day just on that verse. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. Now, at this particular time, the um, temple would be new, nice and shiny. Hadn't been under attack yet. And so it, he's in the new court. And 20 verse 6, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you. Now, talk about rhetorical questions. Asking God if he's great. So is he reminding God that he's great? Or is he reminding himself that he's great? So much of prayer is reminding you of the truth. Reminding you who's in control and reminding you of what you may have forgotten. And so this is the beginning of probably the most gorgeous prayer in all of the Old Testament. And you're talking, you're, and it's sort of setting up now. A godly leader, a godly king, a, people who respond to his leadership and come from all over Judah, from all these cities, and they gather in the house of the Lord. And so Judah here is setting an example of his own personal devotion. He he wasn't going to call the people to do something in a way that he wouldn't do it. So he models it. It's a perfect leadership example for those of you who consider yourself gifted in leadership. And this seems to be a recurring theme through Second Chronicles. You know, the, the leaders who seek the Lord. The good guys throughout this rather odd 400 years of their history is marked by good guys, bad guys, good guys, bad guys. But the good guys are always the ones who seek the Lord first. Hezekiah comes to mind later. Josiah comes to mind a little later than that. And we can expect God to do great things when his people gather together and seek him. I think that's what's so essential to meeting on Sunday mornings when people say, well, I don't need to go to a, a, some place. I can worship the Lord on the golf course or the mountains. Or, well, I, I get worshiping the Lord anywhere and everywhere, but gathering adds a certain strength. And the key word in Jehoshaphat's reign was the, the basic sense of worship, which also meant seeking God's will. So when he's worshiping, the word there can be translated seeking God's will. So worship is seeking God, and you're not just seeking God to, you know, show me a picture. You're seeking God to get an answer from God, to, for him to return his presence, his grace. There's an exchange there. 
So worship is not empty. Worship is, leads to contact with God. And so this is what is happening. Every time you see this, in the Old Testament particularly, it is both worshiping with a lot, a lot of instruments and a lot of singers, but with the purpose of making contact and, and getting instructions and directions. And this is what is happening here. It's a, a nice um, problem that is resolved by the grace and the power of God. Isn't that what trials are supposed to be? Beneficial? Counted all joy and all that other stuff that none of us really believe in? <laughs> but that we're supposed to? So, um, he proclaims a fast. Now, just briefly, uh, it's calling the people to share a corporate humility with each other, a total dependence upon God. And a fast is generally abstaining from all food for a day or more and drinking only water. And Jesus, in Mark uh, 9, 28 and 29, he explained... Uh, the, um, the power and the source of spiritual guidance that comes from just denying yourself and fine-tuning your listening. It, it, you know, for those of you who have learned to dedicate an amount of time, such as devotions to the Lord, know that, first of all, it takes discipline. It take, you, have to be, you have to kind of fight a force, and that is, I'm busy and there's so much more to do. But in denying that, it's, some of you need to fast from your phones. <laughs> but if you fast from food, there's a focus, there's a, an obstacle you have to, to, to focus on, to, to break through, and it, and it fine-tunes your focus, and it's seen as dedication. And every time we dedicate a time to God, we're fasting from something. So he, Jesus deals with, again, Mark 9, the, the basics behind the fast, if you want to use that as a bit of homework, uh, please do. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. This shows something very corporate, again, back to the idea of being the church and gathering uh, as the church. And it, it showed the Spirit of the, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, working in the midst of people to bring something that everybody talks about, but few people attain, and that's unity. You can't have unity in isolation. In fact, isolation causes more confusion than anything else. You get isolated and you start thinking of things out of context. You're, you're in isolation, so you're not seeing the changes that take place in a situation or in a relationship. You make a judgment that's never challenged because you don't gather together with the people who can exercise gifts such as exhortation. You know, gifts are given to the body of Christ. And the gift of exhortation is encouragement. And so people will just willingly, as Christians, isolate themselves from the gifts of the Holy Spirit that come when we gather together. Where two or more are gathered, there he is. And it's just such a waste to have a whole bunch of people with gifts like exhortation to encourage. And gifts of healing. And gifts of prophecy where someone in, in just is sitting down and, and saying some, says something to you that is so profound, the person that said it will never know how profound it was. Some of you are going to hear a thing or hopefully two, Today, then you might interpret it or have it interpreted by the Holy Spirit. And you'll come to me and say, man, when you said this, I just couldn't let us go. I don't think I ever said that. It was something in the realm of a, the gift of prophecy when you hear from God. So <clears throat> I, I try to be patient with people who whine but haven't been to church in 10 years. <laughs> I try. I fail most of the time. Because I don't understand why a person would commit spiritual suicide. It's like starving out front of a steakhouse and then complaining to God about it. So that's enough for that rabbit trail. Verse 7, are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land 
before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence for your name in this temple and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. Do you, do you get the power of that verse? If disaster, it's not enough for him to just say disaster. He's got to list a few. He's got to get specific. Well, if the sword comes upon us, or judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence. Boy, that's some determination by... Don't forget all the people who've gathered from all over Judah and they're hearing their king pray this prayer. And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not... Does this remind you of anything in Acts chapter 4? Lord, behold their threatenings and grant that we might preach the gospel with power and signs and wonders. Does that does it remind you? If you ever wonder when the, you know, the, if the Old Testament ever connects to the New Testament, one of the reasons we're doing this is to survey um, things and link them together that all of these people lived in their faith. And you'll see things that, and hear things and read things. That, well, this reminds me of this. That's because these principles are godly principles and will last for every generation till Jesus comes. And so if this happens to remind you of Acts 4, good. It's the character of God with a bunch of people that lived hundreds of years from these other people. But the principles are tried and true. And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Sir, whom you would not, and this is key, would not let invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. When they came from Egypt, these people were, they, they weren't allowed to go up and, and do battle with them and clear them out. God just said, no, not these folks, not now. And so this is just a little piece of justice. It would be ridiculous for God to let them now come and destroy Israelites. See, it's almost like, like God is sharing with uh, Jehoshaphat some logic God is good, God is great, God is wise. So Jehoshaphat, he did, you know, one of the reasons you don't need to worry about these people is you weren't allowed to wipe them out, the people of Israel, when they came into the land. And they're certainly, certainly not going to do something as ridiculous as now let them come and destroy Israel. I, I, I like God that talks to you, reasons with you, reminds you of things, reminds you of truth. And so th this is also a point or two for Jehoshaphat because he's making this decision with an understanding of the word and what has happened in the past and bringing some reason and logic along with this. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession which you have given to us to inherit. He knew what God had done in the past. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. And that's my favorite line in the whole thing. We don't know what to do. There's a lot of folks that, we, <laughs> that are just too proud to say that, especially if you're a leader. He's the king. He's supposed to know what to do. But he says corporately in front of all these things, Don God, we don't know what to do. And we can't get this done physically because we, we don't have the power against this great multitude. Are you not God in heaven and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Joseph, Jehoshaphat began his great prayer here by recognizing the power of God. Now the environment here was other um, people, other little sub-nations. They all had localized deities that they believed in, and in some cases, such as the Moabites and their, their god, the god of Baal, it, uh, his popularity sort of spread where others' deities weren't as popular. 
Now, because all of those deities are not God, it was just a social confusion, much like we have today. Because everybody's got their own version. And everyone says, yeah, hey, you just worship God any way you want. And he, you know, it's all the same. All roads lead to heaven. And uh, wasn't true back then, and it isn't true now. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of the land? Jehoshaphat, in recognizing what God had done and keeping knowledge of it, active knowledge of it, was very helpful in this area of, of wisdom and what to do in listening to God for a, a strategy. It, we cannot afford to dismiss or disrespect the things God has done in the past. I'm going to make a reference here in a few minutes um, to this, this particular strategy of God, because I've seen this strategy here work before in the past. Probably most people say the last American revival, which may call the Jesus movement. But I'll get to that in, uh, in a minute. But it was a very important, I think, in, in terms of his leadership style to be displaying this respect and knowledge of everything God had done. Now, it, you'll see that also very... Um, it's very repetitious, because remember how many times between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did they get the sand of the sea lecture? <laughs> or they got the stars of the sky lecture. Your numbers are going to be like the sand and like the number of stars. And again and again and again, God would place And so you'll see this respect for the past and knowledge of the past um, just throughout, throughout the scripture. Because it all is connected. And some people have a hard time when you start talking about, well, this, was, this covered a period of 400 years. But it's still interesting because it's the history of God and his experience with his people. And the people who lived it. Okay, I don't know why I needed to go off on that little trail, but, but it must be important to somebody. So Jehoshaphat... Uh, so far as coming up roses, great. His, his whole life plus the life of some of these other kings are great examples because they're, they're living in a midst of, where they're just surrounded by enemies. Surrounded by enemies. All right, we're making it a little adjustment here. Verse 13. Now all of Judah with their little ones, their wives, and their children stood before the Lord. <clears throat> this group is going to see their leader challenged. One of the great um, pieces of wisdom here is by gathering them all together, they were able to unite. And by uniting in prayer, uh, one of the, the commentators I follow, Adam Clark, called this, one of the most sensible, pious, correct, and as to its composition, one of the most elegant prayers offered under the New Test or Old Testament dispensation. And it was all with the people, in front of the people, and aimed at God. Verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, who we know about, son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. Now, all of that tells us that he was the son of important people. And it tells us that he's a Levite, and one of his Levitical duties is in the area of music. Asaph was um, the one that David gave his lyrics to, um, to put to music, or vice versa. And if it was a complete psalm and given to the chief musician, as you'll see, the chief musician most of the time was Asaph. Um, worked for a record company by that name. But <clears throat> in other words, he's in charge of the musicians. And he stands up, 
And he prophesies, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. There's some great words for people in here. And there, there's another one, so concise. Don't be afraid, the battle is not, is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Genuel. Now, if you've got God as your spy, if, he, if he's in charge of security, and, and, he, and God comes and says, here's where they're going to be, here's where they're going to be gathered, and gives complete directions, well, who's the general in this? God. And he's acting like a general. I mean, this, this is a very specific thing. God is not going to send a horde of angels to kill the Ammonites. He says, the battle is not yours, but here's what you need to do. You're going to participate in it. You're going to experience it, all for the purpose of watching me do it. Because, well, if we don't have to fight this, then the fight, can we go home? I mean, that's the way I would think about it. Really? But the prophet, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, tells him this word. And tells him the Lord is speaking through him to tell him where the enemy is going to be. And again, verse 17, you will not need to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Do not fear, but go out there tomorrow. What do you mean i got to face this? Do, yeah, I've got, you've got to go out tomorrow and not fear. Well, I'd, be, I'd like to go home. No, do not fear and get out there. Now that's a combination. Isn't that the way you live life? You, you, get, you can't just fold up and go away. We can't bury ourselves. As Hunter said last, quoting something I never remember saying, uh, that you want to be the lampshade or the lamp. And this again is an exercise. You see, this is an exercise in faith. He wasn't, God just wasn't proving that he's great. He, he already is great. But he wants the people. Because Judah and Benjamin need to survive in the coming years. And so they, and, and while he has them gathered, he's going to create a unified nation with Benjamin and Judah. While he wrestles with the northern ten tribes and their disobedience. So this, he's working on a real foundation with Judah because the, you know, the nation is divided. And Judah's in the right and the northern kingdom's in the wrong. And so he's got to make sure he's got a good base of faith. That's what every church needs. It's what every family needs. And that's what he's building. That's what happens when you, when, when you obey something like that. Do not fear the Lord or be dismayed, but get out there against them, it says. So they're supposed to take their positions. What position is that? For battle. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. That's the right response. Then the Levites of the, and the, of the children of the Kohathites, Kohathites is how that's pronounced, and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. They rose early in the morning and went. They rose early in the morning. They had a night to sleep on it. And I, I, I don't know about you, but things always look different in the, you know, in the light of the, of the morning. But that's when I changed my mind the most about what I'm going to do that day. It's clear. But they got up first thing in the morning and they, as one, they went. They obeyed went into the wilderness of Tekoa, and as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, 
and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. What? Now remember, the prophet is the son of, uh, of uh, he's a Levite, and he's Asaph. He's part of the musical duties. So it kinda, it's not coincidental that these are the orders from Jehoshaphat, but there, it, it's, it's odd. But he consulted with the people. I like, now this doesn't mean that Israel at any particular point was a democracy. But it says here that he, he consulted with the people because he needed their help. He needed their wisdom. I mean, who would choose who goes out in front of the army if you're a horn player? You know? Who, I mean, that was a big selection process. And consulted with the people, he appointed those who should, who should be in the front lines with little harps and other harmless instruments of war. Of course he had the wisdom to go to the people. This was huge. He needed unity. And then, frankly, had to decide who was going to play and who was going to sing. And line them up in whatever order they needed to. They went out before the army. Excuse me. When he consulted, and who should praise the beauty of his homeless. And they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. You heard that statement? This is where it comes from. Aren't you glad we're studying Second Chronicles and not Second Samson? There should have been more people laughing at that because there is no Second Samson. Now, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, Seir who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. One sentence. And the only explanation of strategy is ambushes. Now, it's speculated, uh, speculated all the time of whether it was a, an army of angels or, a, or whatever or what it is. I, I think God is using a strategy he used before called the bait and switch. Remember Gideon? And they had pitchers over the uh, um, torches. And in night warfare, that meant that there was a company following the torch. I mean, somebody has to be the headlight if you're fighting in complete darkness. The streetlights weren't turned on at the time of Gideon. So that, that confused these people. Well, usually when, when Israel went to war, the musicians were, guess where? In the back. They were ready to, to lead worship in a, in a, a, a victory. And you can see it elsewhere in the scripture. Most of the time, most of the time, they were in the back. The horns and the singers and this, this really large crowd of musicians. And this time he puts them in the front. Now, you have the people of Ammon, Moab, and so on. And they're, they're not used to fighting together, right? But somebody probably did a, a little research on the Israelites and, and told them, you know, the rear is brought up by a bunch of goofy musicians. And so it's my opinion, it's just my opinion, that when the musicians came first, it was time to swoop in and attack. And like the Gideon situation, the confusion and their unfamiliarity with each other, the Moabites, Ammonites, and other ites, just slaughtered each other. And that's what it tells us. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of, of Mount Seir and utterly, to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. Evidently, they weren't that clear about who was an ally and who wasn't. But communication is difficult in the open field. We've talked about that every time we've highlighted a battle. And they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked down toward the multitude, and they were all dead bodies. <laughs> That's what it says. Fallen on the earth, no one had escaped. And everybody comes over the hill, you know, the Israelites, and look down and go, 
hmm, what next? <laughs> well, what next is the spoils. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of value, valuables and precious jewelry and so on and so on. And on the fourth day, they assembled the valley of um, Berakha, verse 26. Of that place, they call, uh, uh, was called the valley of Berakha until this day. Verse 27, when they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord made them rejoice over their enemies. Well, of course. I mean, it was, oh, happy daytime. And, and they, they didn't lose a life. They came back with spoils. They returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and rejoiced over their enemies. So then they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord, and they kept the party going. It doesn't really say that, but it was what it means. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. No one was going to plan any fighting with Israel for any time soon. And there is a point when you have enough victory in an area in your life and I believe this, that you fight and fight the enemy and so on, the spiritual warfare. And there is a point, there is a point that once you defeat an enemy of your life, some habit, once it's de defeated long enough or enough times, the enemy, can, he'll move on to something else. It's actually a sign of maturity. It's called personal growth in the Lord. It, it where you understand that the enemy is going to use what works, and when it doesn't work, he stops using it. And then you move on to the next character flaw, or the next bad habit. And my favorite part of this is then the, then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. One of the good guys of the Bible. I want to leave with this. The, 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 the sense is that after Jehoshaphat's great prayer, and it is a great prayer, that the people stood silently before the Lord, waiting on him for some sense of direction or encouragement. And uh, Charles Spurgeon isolated that, that framed that moment when the people were listening. Can you imagine the, the anticipation? After this great prayer, the people silent. And you know, there's no PAs. So for him to be heard, there'd be this, this silence. And then a lingering silence. And Spurgeon said, you could have heard the sound even of the wind among the trees at that time. For they were as hushed and as quiet as you were just now. Oh, when you know the Lord means to deliver you, bow your head and just give him the quiet, deep, solemn worship of your spirit. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there are many of us gathered here today experiencing the benefit of being together and being in agreement that you are great. And we praise the Lord for your mercies are forever, forever and ever and ever. And your mercy. And it is something we want to experience as we go from this place. And we are called to go and to face a hostile world in many cases but our position is simply waiting on you to fight the battle in our behalf. But we have to show up. And Lord, we have to show up to be together, to be exhorted, to be comforted, to 
receive all of the things that come from that, that wonderful dynamic of you saying, when two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am also. There are great benefits to being a church Lord, and there are great, greater benefits of being your individual children and knowing you. And I pray you would just continue to bless us, whether we're gathered together to pray, gathered together to study, gather together to just have fun. And we pray, Lord, for more unity in the fruit that that unity brings. Uh, and that is direction from you and purpose from you. And we uh, ask for those things now in Jesus' name.